Let's talk about Epicene or the Silent Woman. The author is Ben Jonson. He was not born of a great social class, like Shakespeare. Uh, both were born around the same time, uh, to what we would probably call middle-class families. Uh, unlike Shakespeare, Jonson attracted a noble patron who financed his education, though he wasn't able to go on to college. He was planning to go on to college, but he ended up uh, an apprentice bricklayer for a while, anyway. Then he went and joined the army, and uh, uh, in a very unusual situation, he found an enemy soldier that he challenged to, you know, single combat. And, and while both camps were watching, he ended up killing this assailant and stripped him of his arms and armor. And it was you know, this story is often told as an example of how Ben Jonson was not, you know, just a bookish character, but also he he didn't just write uh, these uh, stories; he lived adventures in interesting ways. Uh, he had an early reputation for writing tragedies, but none of his tragedies have survived. And uh, Shakespeare's company produced plays written by Johnson, and Shakespeare would have actually uh, performed in some of those plays. Now, lovers of drama have over the centuries imagined conversations between the, the, the sort of bookish and maybe stuffy and uh, 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 educated elite Johnson and uh, Shakespeare, who was more crowd-pleasing and kind of from the heart um, uh, as an artist. Uh, but we have no records to suggest that they ever had anything more than a, a professional relationship. Uh, Johnson famously griped about some of Shakespeare's artistic choices, uh, but when Shakespeare's works were collected for publication after Shakespeare's death, Johnson contributed not just one poem, but two poems to that collection, praising Shakespeare's work. Uh, Johnson is famous for mastering the comedy of humors by which he would conjure up a situation in which there was a character who was characterized by one particular trait, and he would exaggerate that trait and put a bunch of exaggerated characters together in a ridiculous situation and turn it into a story. Well, speaking of ridiculous situations, let's talk about Epicene or the Silent Woman. Uh, it was performed in December 1609, or perhaps early 1610, uh, a, around a time when Shakespeare and Johnson were both kind of equally famous. And uh, the first production was actually performed by a company of boys. That is, uh, there were no, uh, uh, no women, of course, but no adult men either. It was all, all pre-adolescent boys. And the uh, dedication... Um, has a passage that says, uh, Johnson writes, My hope is not so nourished by example as it will conclude this dumb piece should please you because it had pleased please others before, but by trust that when you have read it, you will find it worthy to have displeased none. Okay, well, what's going on here? Uh, as I was deciding to put together my lecture and figure out what am I going to talk about, I noticed in a production history of this play that a few months after it was produced, the play was actually banned. And um, I looked into it. Um, uh, this dedication calls this play this dumb piece. And the word dumb here doesn't mean stupid. It means, you know, not speaking, like dumbstruck or dumbfounded. Um, so it's a play about a character who is dumb, but the play itself has been silenced. And uh, I, I look into that. Why was it banned? Well, there was, there was kind of a convoluted joke in Act 5 that depended on, on how you interpret an ambiguous use of the pronoun his that seemed, if you interpret it one way, to suggest that the fictional character Epicene was the mistress of the real prince of Moldavia, who was a real person who had visited England a couple years before the play was produced. Okay, I had at one point about a, you know, a three-minute explanation of what that joke was and why it was supposed to be funny and how it, mis how it was misinterpreted. Um, but, you know, ain't nobody got time for that. Um, uh, the joke was spoken by a character named Sir Amorous Le Fool, who, within the world of the play, we know that Sir Amorous Le Fool is not a particularly trustworthy source of information. So in the play, what Le Fool says about Epicene doesn't affect our understanding of Epicene's character. So it really shouldn't affect our understanding of the real Prince of Moldavia. Um, 
But as it happens, powerful people were unhappy enough about this joke that they ended up banning performances of this play. Uh, not over this issue, but for another issue, Johnson was briefly imprisoned over something that he wrote. And uh, I guess when powerful people can put you in jail if they don't like what you've written, if you've made a, a funny joke that hurts their feelings and they throw you in jail for it, that is not good for democracy. So my point in spending this much time in, you know, talking about a joke that's, and the joke itself is not even worth the trouble of explaining, but I just want to remind you that England did not have freedom of the press, or freedom of speech, or freedom of religion for that matter. Uh, these are rights that would form the, the foundation of American democracy a couple of centuries later. And the accusations that Johnson's faced in this play, those accusations were important enough that he mentioned it uh, not only in the dedication, but also in his second prologue. Uh, the prologue is titled Another, and he says, Lest you so make the maker to judge you, for he knows poet never credit gained by writing truths, but things like truths well feigned. So he's saying, he's reminding the readers, the author's job is to make stuff up. And if anybody will, as he phrases it, rest what he doth write, that is rest it, twist it, to misinterpret what he's writing. Um, if you misinterpret what I say, uh, they make a libel which he made a play. That is, if you are misinterpreting my words, you're the one libeling the targets, not me. That's what he says in this um, prologue. When I was in middle school, and my brother was in high school, and he told me that uh, they, they were reading the play, I think it was Macbeth they were reading, and he mentioned that, he said, uh, there's a book that's four times longer than the play Macbeth, and it's all about the play Macbeth. And I remember being, being surprised. You know, my understanding at that time as a middle schooler was that when you wrote about something, you compressed the plot, you summarized the plot, and you mentioned which characters you liked and, you know, maybe talked about some of the words, but it, it just blew me away, this idea that somebody could write a book that was four times longer than Macbeth about the play Macbeth. My time period is the 20th century, from 1920 to 1950, American drama. So um, I am just dabbling in this, but I don't know, I guess I just thought I would just see, uh, uh, I, I'm still just touching on it very quickly, but um, uh, we haven't even started uh, the play yet, and we've had plenty to say about Johnson, and about the production history of this, this play, and um, uh, Johnson put the, the, uh, uh, the dedication and the prologues in this play for a reason. But as a, an English professor, I don't often stop to talk about them, because I want to jump right on to the meat of the play. I, I thought I would spend some time today talking about the prologue. But let's move on to Act One. A room in the house of Claremont, a gentleman who is getting dressed to go out for a party. Uh, he asks his page to sing a song that Claremont himself wrote, and the page warns that if word gets out that Claremont is a poet, it will make it tough for the boy because the boy's already annoyed that the women of a great house uh, make him a plaything. He says they throw him on a bed and kiss him and put a wig on him and uh, tease him and ask him to wear their gowns. And uh, remember, we're watching a play put on by a company of boys who would play all the female roles. And uh, we're watching uh, a boy uh, complain that he's confused that um, courtly women are amused by having him dress up as a woman. So anyway, uh, Claremont's friend Truitt arrives with news that there's a new society of elegant socialite ladies that call themselves the Collegiates, and they live away from their husbands, and they get together regularly to cry down or up what they like or dislike in a brain or a fashion. True, it seems surprised that these women get together and talk about things and ideas and pass judgment with most masculine or rather hermaphroditical authority. They're acting like men or like creatures that have both male and female characteristics. The president of this society is the Lady Haughty, and these are actually the same women that the page was just complaining about. Now, as it happens, Claremont has written a song in which he complains about women who take up all their time powdering their faces and um, still to be powdered, still perfumed, wasting time manufacturing artificial beauty 
when he, Claremont, prefers a more natural kind of just rolled out of bed kind of beauty. He says, the adulteries of art, they strike mine eyes, but not my heart. Uh, adulteries in this sense, uh, the general sense of, of falseness, uh, but possibly suggesting the sin of adultery. Anyway, saying artificial beauty is pleasant eye, con eye candy, but it's not meaningful. Okay, so for his part, Truitt praises all the private work that women do to make themselves look beautiful in public. And uh, uh, Truitt describes this uh, story of one clueless guy who didn't even notice when a lady had put her wig on backwards. And this guy spent a half hour addressing compliments to, I guess, th the bald back of this lady's head. Anyway, in both of these situations, uh, the page boy and this uh, wig story, Johnson is presenting men who are uncomfortable interacting with women, and women whose, you know, reliance upon or misuse of the conventions of fashion are unsettling to the men. All right, well, Truett at this point then pivots kind of suddenly to the, the, the major plot. He's talking about the distress of their mutual friend, uh, Dauphine, uh, the supposed heir to his stuffy and anti-social uncle, Morose. Now, in a modern movie, we'd introduce the character Morose uh, walking down the street, reacting in horror to all the noisy people that he encounters. Um, uh, but uh, uh, theater of this era depends upon words, so we get a story. We have the characters describing a series of comic encounters where they've heard or seen of Morose. Uh, one example is... Uh, um, uh, a noisy street vendor, uh, a bear warden. I, a bear warden is a, a guy, I guess, who, you know, manages a, a trained bear, so, you know, probably a, a big guy. But we learn Morose hated the bear warden's noise so much that he sent the bear warden away crying. So uh, Morose is, is, is very antisocial and hates the noise that people make. So Dauphine arrives with news that his uncle Morose intends to marry. Uh, which means Dauphine will be uh, disinherited. And Morose, we understand, has sent his agent Cutbeard, a barber named Cutbeard, nice name for a barber, sent this agent Cutbeard everywhere looking for a silent woman who, uh, that Morose would be able to marry. And we learn from Claremont that Cutbeard just so happens to have found a, a, a silent woman, a gentlewoman who lives on a nearby street, and... Um, uh, they're about to introduce her to Morose. That is, Cutbeard is going to introduce her to Morose. So Truitt, being a, a good friend, suggests, well, let's go right now and try to break up that marriage. And Dauphine says, nah, I'm kind of busy. And he says, nah, I really don't want to do anything wrong. Uh, Truitt leaves. Uh, Dauphine kind of ramps up the energy. He scolds Claremont for talking about his business, that is, that is a Dauphine's business, in front of Truitt, who's kind of a gossip. And um, uh, Dauphine mentions a new detail, which is that a knight named John Daw is really aggressively trying to woo this woman, um, Epicene. Uh, and John Daw, Jack Daw, is a nickname for, like, a worthless, foolish fellow. And John, you know, Jack is a nickname for John. So anyway... Uh, John Daw, the audience would have recognized in John Daw a parody of a courtly poet. Uh, we understand he, he's got a habit of showering uh, his mistress with praise for being super modest and then asking her to do immodest things with him. So John Daw is foolish, and we, uh, we have the equally foolish uh, Sir Amorous Le Fool who shows up. Uh, he's got a speech about he's descended from a long line of Le Fools and, you know, the Le Fools of the North and Le Fools of the South. It's a big, silly speech that he's not aware what an idiot he is. He mentions a party where he expects John Daw will present this mysterious, silent, gentlewoman epicene. And, uh, well, I mean, that's about it for Act One. There really isn't a huge amount of a plot, uh, but... Um, the places where I summarize and then he gives a speech or he tells an anecdote, recognize that Johnson's original audience, I mean, for them, the price of admission, the purpose that they went was to hear these speeches. They liked listening to these long speeches delivered by talented performers. Uh, the witty banter, the, you know, dramatic dialogue, uh, the layered puns, uh, it's what they paid to see. Imagine if I gave you a play-by-play -play of a football game, 
But all I just did say was, you know, and then the next play the ball was three yards closer to the end zone. Um, uh, just telling you what happens doesn't really capture why people liked going to see these plays.